All right, so continuing pandas, last time we talked about like all of the different display functions of pandas, like dot head, dot tail, um, some of the methods that we use commonly, like dot info, um, dot describe. We also talked about filtering. Um, and so we're gonna level up a little bit. So here I have several sections we're gonna talk about using map and apply, uh, which is basically how you would apply functions over your pandas data frames. We're gonna talk about group buys, um, joining data frames as well as missing values. So these four sections we'll try and cover all of them in the span of a little under an hour. Um, again, any questions, please interrupt me. All right, so let's start with map and apply. So map and apply are used for different purposes um, and they're used to run functions across multiple rows or columns of your data frame. So as always, we always start by importing NumPy and importing pandas. And for this, for the study, we're going to use this data frame again. And we saw it before. It's our, um, it's our car data frame that we talked about last study group. Let's just take a quick look at the dot describe. So they're all of these. They look like they're all numbers with the exception of the name. All right. So remember how when we talked about NumPy, uh, we had this idea of broadcasting. So broadcasting also works on pandas data frames. It's pretty neat. So what I want to do here is I'm going to convert year into its full year because right now year just says 70. And if we're doing a dot describe, let's see, the min is 70, the max is 82. I'm going to just safely assume that they mean 1970 and 1982. Um, and we're just going to add 1900 to each number. So it'll show like, you know, 1970 instead of just 70. So to do that, because we're doing the same function across the entire column, all we have to do is call the function, uh, call the column cardiff year plus 1900. And if we do that, you can see it just adds 1900 to every single value, just like that. And just to check, and what I say here, it's not destructive. Um, if we go back and look at cardiff again, actually to make this less confusing, let's move this down here. RDF, the year hasn't updated yet. So doing things like these is not destructive. If you want it to update, you're going to have to reassign RDF. So you, you reassign RDF by doing something like this. RDF year equals to the original values of RDF year plus 1900. So we run this and we run this. Now we see the year has changed 1970 and 1982. Cool. So broadcasting is like if you want to do something really simple, like like adding or like subtracting, if you want to do like something about the strings, um, that would be the easiest way to do it. Now, there's this idea of Boolean masking. And in section four, several labs do talk about Boolean masking. So let's take a look at several columns of our data set. So let's right now I'm picking out miles per gallon, cylinders, and displacement. So when you want to call multiple columns, that's the syntax of it. You have to feed in a list of list of columns. That's always something to remember. Um, so Boolean masking. So I can feed in conditions on a data frame. And it's going to apply the condition to any data frame. And just to clarify, any subset of a data frame is a data frame. Cool. So one column of data frame is just a series. So unless it's just one column, one column is a series, but as long as you have more than one column, it's a data frame. That's useful to, to, to remember. So here I'm going to do a Boolean mask with this condition. Modulo two is double equal to zero. And that's, I just want to see like which values are even numbers. So there we see a bunch of trues and false. So that's what Boolean masking is. It, basically takes this condition and applies it over every value in the data frame. So here something can be done. This is kind of useful for our purposes for Boolean masking. So let's see. Let's take a look at just the weight of cars. So the weight of cars, I want to look at the weight of cars as more than 2,800. And I got this 2,800 because I think the average weight is around 2,800. Yeah, uh, well, the median weight is 2,800. That's where 2,800 comes from. So this, again, is going to do a Boolean mask, uh, where you have 
trues and falses. And this is basically where each value meets the condition set. So exactly the same way Boolean masking works for, Boolean masking works the same way for data frames and for series. And so this is useful when you're doing filtering. Um, so when you're doing filtering, it's actually actually doing a Boolean mask and then filtering it based on the true false values. Um, so yeah, that's also like a kind of function that you can apply across series and data frames. And so perhaps we have this 2800 number and that's important to us. What we can do is we can use these values to create new, perhaps more useful columns. So let's say maybe you have, I don't know, a particular car shop that only wants like really heavy cars. Uh, we can make a new column by just assigning it like that. CarDF, a new column called heavy. And let's just take a look at what the data frame looks like before we do this. Um, let's just do the head. All right, first it's like this. And we're just gonna add a new column that has the values of whether the car weight is above or below 2800. So we do that, it assigns it, and we take a look at the head and heavy is just gonna be true false. Cool. All right, so this is just like the simpler ways to apply functions on your data frames. Here we're gonna get into map and map we have lambdas again. And this is actually like the third way that I really use lambdas. I think I talked about it first. I use it in like doing filters and then I also talk about it in sort. This is like the third and I think final way I use lambdas in Python. So all right, <clears throat> let's take a look at this. Um, map only works on series or single columns. That's something that's important to remember. And let me just rerun my car data frame so that it resets so I don't get errors later. I'm gonna reset the car data frame for this section. All right, so map, remember map works on only singular columns. Let's take a look. I now wanna, so this function just shows me if the year is above or below 80. And I'm just mapping this function on year. So it's really doing the exact same thing as I was earlier with that Boolean masking. Um, so let's take a look at what the output is. Um, I'm doing kind of a Boolean mask in this way. And the syntax, again, very similar to like the lambdas before, we always start with lambda and then the placeholder variable. And then this placeholder variable is going to refer to each of the rows values in that column that we're mapping on. Cool? So this y is gonna refer to each value in this column. And it's gonna return true false on whether y is less or more than 80. Cool? So that's a simpler thing. All right. Um, so that's how map, that's like the, that is the syntax of math lambda. Um, next, we're gonna do a little more, a little more complicated function. Um, we're gonna look at car name. And let's say I just wanna take car name and extract the car brand. Um, so to do that, to start, some more function that we can use to explore, let's take a look at car df name. Here I put a couple methods that are pretty useful. Um, you can do something like dot unique. Dot unique shows you all the unique values. So you can see here, um, let's see, there are, how many unique values are there? Ah, actually, yeah, so these are all the unique values. N unique tells you how many unique values there are. So 304 unique values out of 397, that's not super great. Um, and then there's also value counts. Value counts is also something that's pretty, pretty neat. Oops, value counts with an S. Value counts basically tells you, okay, for Pinto, I have six. For Maverick, I have five. So that's also something that, that might be useful for you when you're exploring your data. But anyways, just to simplify, let's say I just wanna pick out the three brands that I found first. Um, so here I wanna take, well actually no, before that, Let's find out if the car is a Ford or not. So I'm going to map very similarly to this. I'm going to map to see if the word Ford is in the name of the car. So I'm running this map on car DF name. So I'm running the map on this. And I'm checking for each N, for each name, if Ford is an N. And it's gonna give me a true false on whether there's a Ford or not in that name. So cool. 
looks like the first few are false. We get a true at number four. Uh, at number four, because um, I think yeah, for Torino here, so that's a true. And towards the bottom, we have like three ninety five is true. That's a Ford Ranger, and then three ninety two is a Ford Mustang. Cool. So that works. Um, so basically, it'll return true anytime Ford is in the name. Now to do something a little bit more complicated, what if I want to um, check for multiple car brands? So in that case, instead of writing everything in a lambda, what we could do is we could write a function. And in this function, it actually gives us a little more functionality. So when you're giving a function into lambda, I'm going to define this function. and I'm going to explain it a little bit more later. This function takes in the argument of value. So when you're doing a map function, the argument is each value. And then I'm kind of doing something very similar. If Ford is in value, I want to return the word Ford. Buick, return Buick. And I just formatted it a little different uh, with a capital letter. And if it's not any of those three brands, for simplicity's sake, we're going to return other. So we're going to define this function. And now here in this lambda, instead of just doing something like this, instead of like a Ford in N, we're going to just apply this function onto all the names. So as I mentioned, lambda N, and N is a placeholder variable for each value, which is why I'm going to call car brand my function, and the argument is N. And so we see if I run this, pretty cool. Um, and let's take a look at what the original one was. RDF name. There we go. So you can see it took this Chevrolet Chevelle Malibu, changed it just to Chevrolet. This Buick Skylark Buick, not any of those brands, was all other. So that's how you would take a function on a single column and map that function onto that column. So one one quick question. So this mm -hmm. uh, this uh, function will it run for? Yeah, the you know the dictionary that we were uh, working on, uh, which was uh, about the football t-shirts and players. Okay. Yeah. In the same function with if I say if I use the lambda function first, and then use this, will it work? Um, not really, because none of well, if for some reason, let's say foot in that football dictionary, if like something that I wanted to check, maybe their football sponsors have these like car names in there. Maybe mm. in that situation you could use this, but probably not because this function was created specifically for this data set. Mm. Uh, but you could write other Lambda functions to work on dictionaries as well. Does that okay. make sense? Mm. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, so basically what's important to, to note is that whatever value you want to like come out here, that's what you have in your return statement. Cool, so you're checking the condition here and then whatever you want returned in place of that value would be what you have in the return statements. I have another question. Could you also just do some sort of for loop instead of a map function? Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, you can, but it's kind of, um, there is an article that I'll send out later, but it's kind of like a cardinal sin to run a for loop on a data frame. Um, apparently, it's just extremely, well, it's kind of inefficient. Um, sometimes it's necessary if you have to do something extremely specific, but um, mapping a function across a, a, a data frame is just much more efficient because it kind of uses the broadcasting aspect that, um, that like NumPy allows for where you just do, you're doing everything at once versus like, you know, running a for loop through every value. So you can definitely run a for loop and like have pretty much this same function, um, but, but yeah. And then one final thing to note is that this output is just a series and it's not changing my data frame yet. If I wanted to take this and add it to my data frame, because currently CardiF, CardiF doesn't have like this stuff, I would just assign, I would just make a new column in my data frame and call it maybe brand make that equal to this. And then let's take a look at CardiF now. And so now CardiF has this brand that came from my map. Cool? All right. 
Um, so now we're done with map. One level up from map is dot apply. I actually personally use dot apply more than dot map. Um, I guess really quick before we get into dot apply, there's another one called apply map. Apply map is something that I don't use as often. I use I probably use apply map the least, but apply map um, allows you to to map a function across your entire data frame. So apply map. Let's take a look really quickly. Um, let's see. Here, what I'm doing is I'm apply map works on the full data frame. Remember that map only worked on a series. Apply map works on, on the data frame, and what I'm doing it takes in the value. And what I'm doing is I'm turning every single value into a string. So we take a look at that. Um, if we take a look at like the displacement variable, and then you can see that the D type is an object. Um, in pandas, strings are objects instead of um, instead of integers. I mean, strings are objects, and they don't say. Pandas refers to strings as objects. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, cool. But anyways, if we take a look at cardf.columns, and let's reassign this to new. If we take a look at um, new.describe. Oops, I wanted to do .info, actually. Don't mind. .describe. You can see that these are all objects, so they've, they've all converted to strings. Apply map is probably the one that I use the least, so that's why this is just a quick little segue. All right. Um, okay, so let's take a look at these columns again. All right. So dot apply is the one that I use the most. So here there are actually three functions. There's map, there's apply map, and then there's apply. Just to reiterate, because I think it's very important to remember, map works on a series. Apply map is if you want to map a function on every value of a data frame and apply allows you to uh, allows you to apply functions across rows or columns and most commonly columns and I'll just show you a quick example. So here we have our data frame cardf let's do a dot hit and see look at it again. Here we go. Now let's say when you're doing when you're doing a data science project, very often what you're going to do is you're going you sometimes are going to engineer new variables um, that are a combination of your existing variables. So one example here, let's say I want to create a variable that is the horsepower per weight of the car. So I just want to get like a ratio of horsepower per weight. So I would just want to take like horsepower divided by weight and have that as a separate variable. Um, so what I can do is I'm defining a function and for dot apply your functions that for your functions used in dot apply the argument is the row or the column but more likely the row. So for each row I'm just going to take the value of horsepower divided by the value of weight and that's the function that I'm defining. And then in the same way that I used it for map, I'm going to pass it through a lambda r for row and then call the function and apply it to every row. When we run that, you can see that this is our ratio. And axis equals to one is just to tell it that you're running the that you're running the function across columns rather than across rows. Or kind of you're applying it across rows rather than across columns. I know it's like, it depends on which way you're thinking about it, but just know that if you're trying to create a new column, it's usually axis equals to one. And if it doesn't work, you can always like trial and error and see if axis dot zero, if that doesn't work, try axis, axis equal to one. But for the most part, I actually, for most functions, do axis equals to one. Because you want to make sure that the same function is being applied to every row. Cool, so we have this ratio here. And then the same thing, we always want to make that new column because these are not destructive functions, we would do cardf, call it maybe horsepower per weight, hp per weight, equals to this. And now, if we look at cardf again, we get this new ratio column. 
Any questions? So that was map, apply map, and map. And those are just ways that you can apply functions in different ways um, across your data frame. Cool. This is probably something that you're, you guys are going to use um, during, during your projects. So it's always good to know the syntax and also like that, the fact that you can even do this. All right, moving on from applying functions, um, we have group by. So group by just lets you group data. And when you group data, you have to do that with an aggregation. An example is, let's start with an example here. Let's see if I have this here. Yeah, let's take a look at cardiff.head again. And here I'm looking at cylinders. And here, if I remember correctly, cylinders there are not that many different values. Let's take a look at um, cardiff cylinders dot uh, unique. All right, so it's just like there are five different kinds of cylinders. So let's say I want to see per cylinder which has like the highest weight. Like I just want to see it, the average weight across cars that have eight cylinders, the average weight across cars that have four cylinders, so on and so forth. And so I can do that by grouping by cylinders, which means it'll separate each cylinder into its own group, and then performing an aggregation. So group bys must always come with must always come with an aggregation because you're sort of like smushing your data frame down to just those categories. And you need to like sum or like put your data together within those categories somehow. So here I'm just taking the mean. So these are some of the most common aggregations. You have your mean, median, your different kinds of averages. You have like the number, the count, and I'll sort of like demonstrate that later, and min and max. Those are some of the most common aggregations. So really quickly, when I do this, I did a dot mean. It basically, for each cylinder value, it averaged every other thing. So here you can see that for three cylinders, um, it had averaged all of these values across every car that had three cylinders. And this is really helpful because, because it lets us compare categories. Like for example, all right, like let's say, let's see weight of a car. Like it seems that like the more cylinders you have kind of like the higher the weight, the heavier your car. So that's really useful in helping you like compare categories within your data. Um, to make it a little cleaner, because I know like getting, maybe getting like a mean, I don't know, I don't know cars that well, but getting a mean year doesn't really mean anything or getting a mean origin is less useful. Usually you'll just take a subset of your data. Like let's say I care about the mean miles per gallon, the mean uh, weight, and the mean, uh, I don't know, let's see, horsepower, for example. And so this just makes it a little cleaner so you're not like, uh, so you're not seeing all the columns when, because not all of these averages make sense. It depends on the project, depends on the context. You will hopefully know your data set better than I know cars. Uh, so yeah, that's group by. And so really quick, just to see like the different values, uh, different, um, different aggregations we can do. We can do a dot count and dot count will literally tell you and dot count because um, every is just counting how many belong in each category. So that's why these numbers are all the same. So you can see that in our data set, four, four cylinders is the most common. Um, and then followed by eight cylinders and we only have like three cars that have five cylinders. So that's how group by is used. We'll talk a lot more about group bys when we get to SQL, because um, group bys are very, very common when we, when we use SQL. So that will be uh, next week. Any questions so far? All right, next we're moving on to combining data frames. Um, there are many different ways to combine data frames. Uh, there's concat and there's join. Um, there's also merge, but merge kind of works the same way as join. So if you ever see like a dot merge, it works very similarly to dot join. Um, so anyways, this I pulled from one of the labs. Um, and I think the lab is literally called combining data frames. Um, so concat, We'll start with concat. Concat sticks data frames together. Um, so let's say we have these data frames and they started off as dictionaries and let's just print these real quick. You can see that the columns are constant, A, B, C, D, 
and you just have these different values, different index numbers, and we just want to stack them on top of each other. Um, use cases of this, sometimes maybe you have like a bunch of data, but each data frame that you have is like a different year. So let's say you have one data frame that's like 2020 data, one data frame that's 2019 data, and maybe you just want to put it together. You would use something like pd.concat, and as long as the, um, the column names will match up, you can concat them. Nicely. There we go. So concat is probably the most, the simplest because it assumes that your data is consistent across your data frames and it literally will just like stack them together. Um, I think the order, the order does matter. So let's say if I change the order df3, df2, it flips around. So order does matter. So make sure that you're feeding it in, in the order that you want. Or you can actually sort data frames. Sorting data frames is also a method. If you're interested, you can look it up. All right, in this case, um, you get to a middle ground. So there's concat and there's join. Within concat, there are some join functionalities. I know that's a little bit confusing, but within concat, you can do certain things that join can do. And here I'm just gonna demonstrate some of them. So let's start with this new data frame, DF4. And as you can see, DF4 has columns B, D, and F. DF1 here has A, B, C, and D. And so here we can't really do a concat because one, they don't even have the same number of columns. I think if you do a concat, actually I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know if they will give you a, I wonder what concat will do if you do this. There we go. So if you throw that concat, it'll just give you a bunch of NAND values because it's, it will like automatically match the columns. Um, like for example, you see like B and D are common columns. That's why in B and D we don't have NAND values, but in any other column, they'll throw you a NAND value. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, so this is joining data frames by like stacking them vertically, I guess vertically joining data frames, but you can also join data frames horizontally. And that's when it gets a little more tricky because there are different kinds of joins. So let's ignore this for now. Let's take a look at um, let's take a look look at these two data frames, data frame one and four. Um, I'm going to open up some documentation in a little bit to show the different kinds of joins. Um, but first, let's see what an inner join on axis one. And so, because we're doing it um, horizontally now, we're doing axis equals to one. Whereas when we concatenated it before, it was axis equals to zero. Let's take a look at what this gives us. Interesting. So when we're joining on axis equals to one, it tries to match up the index. So here you can see because the only common index numbers are two and three, um, it keeps two and three. And this, whether it keeps two and three or gives you a bunch of NAND values depends on the kind of join. So here I actually supplied an inner join. To contrast, you can also do an outer join. And here you can see exactly the opposite of what I was talking about. Um, two and three has no NAND values, but then here you have NAND values um, in the BDF up here and on the ABCD down here. Cool, so those are different kinds of joins. Um, to quickly summarize the kinds of joins, inner joins only keeps the rows that have indexes in both tables, and outer join returns a combination of all rows. Um, what's kind of annoying is that there's also a left join and a right join, but concat doesn't do left join and right joins. If you wanna do left join or right join, you have to do a PD dot join. That's kind of an annoying thing, which is why I typically default to using dot join instead of concat when I wanna join that way. All right, so there is some documentation over here on the different kinds of joins. Some people like this, um, this graphic a lot. So if you remember the full outer join uh, with the one with the NAND values, you're trying to keep all the rows on both tables and then just supply NAND values wherever else. Inner join only keeps the rows that are matching for both. Left join keeps the left values table, the left values rows, left tables <laughs> rows, and then matches only the right ones that join and then right is the opposite of that. Um, we will see more of that when we get to SQL. 
Um, so anyways, back to this. Um, this is doing the outer join. And I also put the documentation for merge here, but merge and join are very, very, they're pretty, they're almost the same. So anyways, this is doing the outer join. And here I'm going to just show you like the left and the right join. So the syntax is a little different. For concat, we're just supplying it a list of data frames. Whereas for join, because the left and right matters, you always start with left data frame dot join right data frame. So that's something that's good to remember. So let's take a quick look. We're doing uh, we're doing left we're doing df one dot join df four and for this purpose let's just print out df one and df four. All right. So as you can see, the index here we have zero one two three zero one two three. And here they're only looking up the rows that match the indexes that exist in data frame one and attaching those values. And that's why these are all NAND values and we don't have six and seven. Um, another little thing that they'll ask you to add, um, there's this suffix and I supplied four for data frame four. Can anyone sort of see where that comes in? Anyone? All right, so you're adding the suffix because here we have some column names that are the same, right? We have, in DF1, we have um, the column name B, and in DF4, we have the column name B as well, and we also have D and D. So that's why you see here, when you have column names that are the same, you wanna just make sure that your, um, you're giving it a suffix so we can kind of like differentiate. You think knows how to do all this? What's up? Who's that? Did someone say something? I oh, never mind. Um, anyways, um, yeah, that's why we need the suffix, just so we know like which ones, which columns had come from that extra, that second data frame. Cool? Yeah, that was kind of a confusing. But yeah, any questions? All right, yeah. Joins are actually pretty important. There's one lab that um, talks about combining data frames, and they actually supply you, they actually supply you with a bunch of um, CSVs where you can join. Like, I think it's like from some card game. And then you're joining your cards with like, powers or something like that. Anyways, joining data frames, kind of important. Um, okay. This last section, I'm going to talk about missing data. Um, so the main things about missing data is you can check if something is missing and then there's also fill in a. So let's just use this one as a test data frame because this one had some NAND values. I did an outer join for DF1 and 4 and I kept I dropped the duplicate columns just to make things a little easier for us. And so I mentioned this in last study group, but a very helpful uh, function that I use is, is na.sum, because when you do that, it tells you how many NAND values exist in each column. That's just something that's helpful to see, like, okay, which columns do I have to like check for NAND values and what should I do with them? So there's is na, and then there's fill na. Fill in A, as the name suggests, just fills all the NAND values. Um, here, I'm going to open up this documentation. I'm going to go through it later. Um, but the easiest way you can fill NAs is NAs are actually different from zero because NAs, NANs stand for not a number, and zero is still a number. So sometimes to make things easier for you, so that like you know, you're if you're doing a mathematical operation, you don't get thrown off because you can't calculate on not a number. Um, you can just fill it with zero. So there, uh, something as simple as that will fill all the NAND values in your data frame with zeros. If you want to get a little more scientific than that, you can supply per column what value you want to fill in uh, your NAND values with. So here is actually pretty neat. You supply it with a dictionary with like column name and then what to fill the NAND value with. So here I'm saying for 
every NAN in A, I want to fill it in with 3. For every NAN value in C, I want to fill it in with 2. And every NAN value in F, fill it in with 4. And then I'll just use fill in A. Um, I'll go to the documentation right after this. Supply the values as this dictionary. And then there we go. You can see that all the NAN values uh, turn into 3s, 2s, and 4s. Um, one of the main things you're going to have to do with data cleaning is filling in or cleaning out missing values. Um, and I think the pandas documentation is really great on all the different ways that you can do that. So um, let's take a look at just the examples. So in this example, they talked about filling everything with zero. So fill in a zero. That was the example that I showed earlier. Um, you can forward fill. Forward fill is pretty cool. So this is the, their original data frame up here. Let me make this a little bigger so y'all can see. All right. This one up here was their original data frame. And they forward fill. So basically, you see how we have these two NAND values under 3 here? They just forward filled that with 3. So that could be helpful in something like if you have like a sequence of data that's like sorted, and let's say like you arrange some people by like height order, and you want to like fill in those values, you can like fill in forward fill with that. I think there's also a backward fill. I forget, but that's something that's pretty easy to look up. This is the example that I demonstrated earlier for like specific columns. Um, and then another thing you can do is you can limit how many NAND values to fill in. I personally haven't had a situation where I had to do that, but uh, it fills the, um, it only fills the first NAND value that it finds. And so I think in this case, um, here, the first, the very first value was a NAND value and they filled that in with zero because I think they're using this dictionary where like A points to zero and therefore this is with zero. Any questions? This finished a lot faster than I thought. I expected a lot of questions just because I, I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of stuff in pandas. But yeah, for one-on-ones, the upcoming one-on-ones, I know like not the ones this week, but the ones starting next week, um, I would love to see there's this project in section five um, that is here, data cleaning in pandas. There's this project over here and it's pretty open-ended. You can clean it however you like, but I just like to, I don't know, see you demonstrate some of these cleaning functions, like, um, using, uh, using filtering, using fills, using, uh, using your dot apply functions, use some of that. And I would love to see how, you work on that. It's, it's pretty open-ended. Yeah. Dealing with missing values, talking about all these things that we talked about today, and then this stuff, pretty, uh, pretty open-ended. Um, I know they do ask for plots. Um, you don't have to do the plots because we haven't talked about it yet, but uh, if you look at the solutions, the, the code for plots is not too hard to understand so far but I do want to wait till Monday to talk about plots more in depth. Any more questions? Cool. Any like overall feelings about pandas? Maybe you, maybe we all require one more session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really depends on time. Um, we do have like one more like slot. If we look at the calendar here, um, let's see. If we look at our calendar, every every mod has some like built in like freer slots for like recap. So you can mm. see when we get to section ten, this study group here. Um, mm. I was gonna use it to like introduce the project, but we can also use it to like go over any things that we want to go over. Yeah, sounds good because I. Because I, I felt like, okay, this was a bit heavy today. Yeah, it was a lot of stuff. It was a lot of stuff. Um, this, these notes are up there. I, I personally think just like, you know, getting, a, getting the hang of how these methods work, just like testing them on different things. So going through this, going through the labs on learn, that's hopefully going to be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. 
I guess let, let me see how this weekend takes me. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions? Cool. Yeah, as usual, um, I'm always available on Slack. So feel free to ping me whenever. Um, I have I have gotten like quite a few people pinging me like at night. Um, just know that I usually stop working at about seven Eastern time. And so if I don't reply to you, it's because I have my computer off. But I'm usually back up around like 10. So, so yeah, just so you guys- Sorry about that, yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Yeah, it's just like usually I'll just like get to the questions in the morning. But it's also good if you have questions to send to me so I can see what you're getting stuck on. So maybe we can like work on that or I can still answer those questions when I get to them in the morning. Cool. Any last questions? If not, we get 15 minutes back today. Um, let me pause this. Recording.